speak your word and it shall not speak. but can you imagine what would have happened if the church hadn't prayed for Peter where was God when Stephen was stoned to death where was God when James were assassinated was assassinated and the same thing would have happened to Peter kept in prison bound in chains and I was ex I thought that Peter would have been praying himself but he did not pray he had given up he was discouraged he had accepted the situation and he had he was just there ready to go to heaven and yet he was needed here more than in heaven he hadn't written the, the first and second book of Peter he hadn't even started his ministry and the enemy wanted to kill him hear me I know you love the Lord and I love the Lord too but let me tell you something church we got to stop all these religious games and all these religious saying the Lord is in control the Lord is in control he's only in control of those who are submitted to him submit yourself to God then resist the devil you can't even resist the devil unless you are totally 100% submitted to, the, to God And you can't bind the devil. I hear Christians saying, Satan, I bind you. Who gave you the right to bind him? You can't bind him. You bind demons. You don't bind Satan. His time to be bound has not yet come. But you can resist him. You can prohibit him. You can override his power. You can interrupt his activities. You can revoke his assignment. You can rebuke him. You can prohibit him. And if we don't understand the rules of engagement, the Bible said my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And the knowledge he's talking about is not sense knowledge. He's talking about prenostos. The highest level of knowledge, which is revelation. Now come with me to the book of Acts chapter 16 and verse 25 and 26 and 27. Acts 16, 25. Acts 16, 25. Mm -hmm. And it reads. And 25 and at mid, to 27. And at midnight, Paul at and midnight. Silas prayed. Look at me. At midnight, what do you do? Pray. At midnight. Look at me. There is something about praying at midnight. I'll teach you that next time, not this time. There is something about praying and engaging God and the enemy at midnight. Because midnight is the dawning of a new day. And whatever will happen tomorrow begins at midnight. And if you are a real intercessor, you have to engage the enemy at midnight. When he's waking, you are also waking. And you wake up in the morning and you have the upper hand. There are four watches of the day and there are four watches of the night. And you know the problem with we, we believers? We are very lazy folks. Very, very lazy. We are good in criticizing and being critical about everybody's problem and always talking, 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 but we are very lazy. The Jews pray three times a day all their lives. The Muslims pray five times a day all their lives. How many times a day do we pray? We don't. We don't have a prayer life. How are you going to fight an enemy who is praying the same thing against you five times a day? How are you going to win? Pronouncing curses on you five times a day, every day. Every day. Invoking curses on you. And I'll show you tomorrow when I deal with the veil. Because one of the things the Muslims do, I understand them very well. I have some very, very good Muslim friends. One of the things they do is to say, let the infidel be blinded. And they call us Christians infidels. And one of the reasons why 9-11 was not discovered, 9-11 was not a physical act. It was a spiritual warfare on the sovereignty of the United States. That's why if you look at all the, doc the documentary, they had opportunities, but they kept on missing it. And I show you something on the screen today. How when the king of Britain, D. 
declared a national day of fasting and prayers. The Bible talks about the fact that there were many moves, interventions of God, and many, many major mistakes that was done by Hitler's commanders that gave Britain the upper hand. So spiritually, when somebody is at war with you spiritually, one of the things they do against you is to invoke curses. I will show you that on Tuesday night. How Goliath didn't fight David with his strength and his armor, but invoked curses from the five gods of the Philistines' gods against David. And how David had to step out of the natural and access the supernatural and invoke the curses of Elohim against Goliath. Hear me, our warfare is not on a physical plane. For the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle. And our wrestling is not with flesh and blood, but it's against cosmic powers, persons without bodies. And I'm not telling you this to put fear in you. I'm letting you know that you have authority to deal with them in the name of Jesus. For in the name, at the mention of the name Jesus, every knee of things in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bow. Anything that has a name must bow. Go ahead. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and uh -huh. sang praises unto God. Uh -huh. And the prison, prisoners heard them. Uh -huh. And suddenly, suddenly, there was a great earthquake. Look at me. What was the result of the suddenly? I know a lot of you want suddenly, but suddenly don't just come. That's the problem of the church. Everybody is just confessing, wishing. It's not enough to wish something or to desire something. Or to believe something. There's a difference between belief and faith. And there are two kinds of faith. And two levels of faith. We'll deal with that some other day. Can't give you everything today. Are you hearing me somebody? But look at me. On the day of Pentecost. When they had tarried. Fasted and prayed. For ten days. What happened? The Bible says. Suddenly. There was what? A suddenly. What was the result of the suddenly? Ten days of tearing, fasting, and praying. The reason why other religions are not getting converted to Christianity is because we are weak. We are not powerful. We just talk and talk and talk and talk, but we have no power. We have nothing to show for. And that's why a lot of people are converting to yoga. And to other religions. The church must go back to the place of power. I said we must return to the place of power. Yes. If you don't believe me, ask your grandmother. She'll tell you. Ask your grandmother. The old mothers and fathers in the church. They will tell you what the church used to be like. The church today has become another organization, another, another American dream. And as much as I love systems and we respect systems and there has to be order, demons have no respect for systems. And I told you the reason why 9-11, they couldn't, uh, the, the intelligent network, America has one of the most sophisticated intelligent networks in the whole world. And the reason why they couldn't locate that plot was because the plot was a demonic and a spiritual plot. It wasn't a physical plot. And all, all the gadgets we have at the airports, none of them are designed to locate or to identify or to pick a demon. They don't have the capacity to locate a demon. The only group of people who have the power and the capacity to locate a demon spirit is the church. It's only the church that have discerning of spirits to be able to discern the spirit that is operating behind a particular manifestation or an individual.
Paul and Silas at midnight prayed. Let's see the results as a result of their prayer. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. There was a suddenly, there was a great earthquake. Go ahead. So that the foundation of the prison were shaken. The foundation of the prison was shaken. And immediately. And there was an immediately. All the doors were open. You know why some of you are not getting immediate miracles and immediate healings and immediate signs and immediate wonders? It's because of prayerlessness. And spiritual laziness. And we have, we have a word for every situation. We have a message and an answer for every situation. When all we have to do is to go in there and tarry in prayer and deploy Elohim and the hand of the law through fastings and prayer. And let's see divine interventions and divine activities. Let angels descend and ascend. Let God move and have his way. We don't want the move of God because we want to control everything. If you want the move of God, step out of the way. Put your stomach down. Tarry. Go into prayer and let God have his way. Somebody shout yes. Yes. Go ahead. And immediately all the doors were opened. You know why there is no open doors in the church? A lot of doors are shut to believers. We're struggling like the unsaved. Can't pay our bills like them. And yet we don't drink like them. We don't smoke like them. We don't move around sleeping around like they do. And yet they have more money than us. And we are jealous and envious of the of unsaved people. You know why? You know why you are full of anger? Have no testimony because there are no open doors. And the only reason why all these things happened was because Paul and Silas prayed. And I want you to hear me. You see, praise has its place. But prayer must precede praise. Are you hearing me, somebody? You got to know when to pray and when to praise and when to worship. But the Bible said they prayed and then they sang praise. Go ahead, see what happened. And everyone's bands were loose. Everyone's chains were loose. You know what? There's a lot of chains and addiction and oppression in the church. People are bound with all kinds of addictions and habits and things. And they can't free up themselves because there is lack of supernatural power. It's prayerlessness. Go ahead. And the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep and seeing prison doors open. Prison doors what? Open. Prison doors what? Open. I command open doors in the name of Jesus. Jesus. I declare within these days of the past, there will be open doors in our lives. Financial open. Open doors for marriages. There will be open doors. Somebody say close doors. Shout. Somebody say close doors. Open, 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 open. Sir, sir. Sir, can you open this door? This door, can you open it and shut it? Open both doors, open both doors and shut it. You see how these doors open? A lot of you, your miracle is behind this door. And by the end of the fast, you will experience an open door. Somebody shout an open door, an open door. Somebody give it to him, somebody give it to him. Somebody shout, somebody shout and declare open door. Somebody shout. Close doors, open, 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 open. Let the doors be open. Please be seated. The reason for jealousy in the church and little envies here and there is because a lot of people are not experiencing open doors. But brother, sister, if you're experiencing open doors and you have your own man and your own miracle, you don't care what anyone has. Won't you look at me? Paul and Silas would have been murdered the next day. They would have been killed if they hadn't taken things into their hands to pray and to praise at midnight and they just slept. The enemy would have determined the outcome of their lives. And they said, no way, not this time around, no more and never again. And they went into prayer, and their prayer summons heaven. 
And there was a divine summons. And an angel of the Lord appeared on the scene. Shook the foundation of the building. Broke everybody's chains. Opened the door. Now watch this. Look at me. If you look at the scripture carefully, there's a very interesting thing there. I don't think you saw it. How many people prayed? Two. Two people prayed. Paul and who? Silas. Now, look at how many people benefited from that prayer. Everyone else. Look at it. Put it on the screen. Every prisoner. Every prisoner's chains were loose. Every prisoner doors were open. All the prisoners came out of the prison. Their chains were loose. Their doors were open. And they did not pray. They benefited from the prayers of Paul and Silas. Do you know why the devil don't want you to pray? Because when you pray, things happen. When you pray, others benefit. When you pray, others are loose. When you pray, you don't just get breakthrough. Other people get breakthrough. Yes. So the devil don't want you to pray. Have you ever, have you realized this? That you can be watching a movie for many hours. And you are awake and into the movie. And then suddenly the movie is ended. And then it's time to pray. And suddenly you begin to yawn. And your whole body, the spirit of slumbering begins to come upon you. In the name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus. And then there's a new movie that just comes on and your body is awake. Immediately you are ready to watch a new movie. That is the devil fooling with you, my brother and my sister. Because prayer is what engages God. I'm telling you. Look at me. The difference between the Babylonian captivity, when Jeremiah prophesied in Jeremiah 29 about the 70 years Babylonian captivity, and God had promised that after 70 years in being in captivity in Babylon, that he would bring them back. When it was a year before 70 years, 69 years, Daniel discovered the prophecy. And he began to fast and began to pray and he engaged God and engaged the prince of Persia. And the prophecy came to pass within a year. Now watch this. I'm going to say something very serious here. I want you to hear me carefully. Something very serious here. Moses was raised as a leader to bring deliverance to God's children. And God promised in Genesis 15 that Abraham, your descendants will go into captivity for 400 years. And after 400 years, I will bring them out of bondage with great substance. Church, New Destiny, hear me. It's not what you go through that matters, but it's how and what you come out with. And I know you're going through some pain right now, but come out with something. Come out better than you went through this situation. Now look at me. Moses at the age of 40 years. At the age of 40 years. Moses. Watch this. At the age of 40 years. Moses. Attempted. To help his people. By the arm. Of flesh. At that time. They have been in captivity. For over 300, and there were about 390 years at the time Moses was 40 years. Now keep your eyes on me. And God said, You've been in captivity for how many years? 400 years. Because Moses tried and leaned on the arm of flesh, the prophecy was deferred. For another 40 years. Because there wasn't an intercessor. And Moses himself didn't understand his mission and assignment. Now watch this. At the time he discovered the prophecy. They had been in captivity for 390 years. 
Then he ran out of Egypt to the wilderness of Sinai for another 40 years. Watch me here. Watch me. They stayed in captivity for 430 years. They had to wait for Moses for another 40 years. Which prolonged their deliverance. Took them from 400 years to 430 years. Two reasons why their deliverance was prolonged. Number one, the lack of intercession. Because an intercessor, an intercession would have expedited and brought, it would have accelerated the promise of God and the whole process of the preparation of Moses to come back and deliver them. There wasn't an intercessor. So the promise was put on a hole. Number two reason. The leadership was not ready. Because God don't do things without a leader. They needed a leader. And the leader wasn't ready. Why was he not? Why was the leader not ready? Few things. Number one. The leader needed an encounter with Elohim. You can't lead God's people unless you've had an encounter. You can't confront the devil unless you have a point of reference. And so God engaged Moses at the burning bush. And when he met Elohim, he said, who are you? And he said, I am. I am. Whatever you need, I am. I am the source of life. I am the source of power. I am the king of kings and I am the lord of lords. I am the governor among the nations. I am the source of all power. I am is my name. If you need wisdom, I am. If you need protection, I am. Whatever you need and ever will need, I am. Now watch this. He encountered God at the burning bush. And God said, Moses, you are wanted in Egypt. And I want to change your whole destiny. I want to make you a brand new man. And I'm going to send you back to Egypt. But before you can confront Pharaoh and deliver my people, you have to overcome the ruling spirit of Egypt. And the ruling spirit of Egypt is the serpent, the snake. They are always on the crown of the Pharaohs of Egypt. That is the ruling spirit of Egypt. So God said, Moses, before you go to deliver my people, you have to conquer that thing. You must engage the enemy, contend with the enemy here in the wilderness. Conquer that thing. Master it before you go there. He said, what do you have in your hand? He said, a rod. He said, cast it down. He threw the rod down and he became a snake. And then he ran away from the snake. And God said, you can, watch this, you cannot confront what you don't see. And you can conquer what you don't confront. So Moses, now that you've seen the ruling spirit of Egypt, confront it. Take it by the tail. Only a fool would take a snake by the tail. And God said, I want you to confront your fears. I told you something this morning. I was going through some crisis some years ago in my life. And I had prayed and fasted. And I was seeking God for direction and confused. Everybody was giving me all kinds of crazy counseling. And I went to the Lord and he didn't speak for days. And then he whispered to me one time. And he said, my son, Nicholas, if you are not afraid, what will you do? And that was my deliverance. Why don't you look at me? Moses took the snake by the tail. He conquered his fear. God said, you got to deal with this fear of the ruling spirit of Egypt. You have to overcome this prince of Egypt before you go to Egypt. You can't deliver my people if you are afraid of what controls them. If you can't conquer this thing, you can't deliver them. So he took it by the tail. He became a snake. And God said, now you have the upper hand over the ruling spirit of Egypt. The next thing I have to do is, I have to deal with your heart. The condition of your heart. I got to show you what is in your heart. I got to circumcise your heart. Put your hand in your armpit around your shoulder. Put your hand there. He put his hand there. God said, pull it out. He came out leprosy. And God said, you see what is in your heart? You can't deliver my people with this thing in your heart. You got to get it out of your heart. 
has to have a tender heart and a pure heart towards me. And God said, now that I've dealt with your heart, and you've dealt with the ruling spirit of Egypt, go now. And nobody could bring up his past. When God decides to favor you, and you pass the test of God's exam, God does not consult your past to determine your future anymore. And no man can bring up your past. You remember when Jacob was returning to his father's house to meet his brother Esau? Esau had laid ambushment for Jacob. And was waiting for Jacob. And had all his antennas and raiders to pick Jacob's DNA. He had his blasters, social security number and everything. And was ready to pound on Jacob. And Jacob had an encounter with an angel of the Lord and wrestled all night long with an angel of the Lord. And then by the break of the morning, he said, bless me. I won't let you go before you bless me. Now, at that time, Jacob was already blessed. But when he wrestled with the angel of the Lord, the veil was removed. And he realized that there was yet another dimension of blessing he didn't have. Look at somebody and say, don't be satisfied with where you are. There is more beyond. Sometimes we get a little blessed and we have all kinds of attitudes. And we sacrifice good relationship for blessings and fame. Are you hearing me, somebody? The only reason why I'm here is because of a relationship. I'm here because of relationship, not because of money. I'm telling you. Because I'm blessed. I didn't come here because of money. I came here because of a relationship. I came here because I had a relationship with your pastor. It has been a long-standing relationship. And relationship will take you where money can take you. So please take it easy when you get blessed and you become famous. And you think you are the latest thing in town. And then you break all bridges. Don't bend bridges because you never know who you will need tomorrow. And the angel of the Lord wrestled with Jacob. And he said, Jacob, Jacob said, I won't let you go till you bless me. The angel said, it's good. You want to be blessed? What is your social security number? And he gave him his social security number. He logs into the computers of heaven and say, there is no Jacob in the records of heaven. According to the, your social security number, your name is Israel. A prince with God and not Jacob. And he said, Jacob is an imposition. Jacob is an error. Your real name and true identity is Israel. So the angel said, I'm going to have to do something about you. Because Esau have laid an ambushment for you and he's waiting for Jacob. So he touched him by his side and dislocated him. And he started leaping. Anointed, but leaping, and had a scar. And when he came out, everybody couldn't figure him out. And Esau was waiting for Jacob. And what he saw was not Jacob. He saw Esau. He, he saw Israel, and Israel hadn't circumvented him. Israel hadn't stolen his birthright. Israel hadn't hurt him, so he couldn't touch Israel. What he wanted was Jacob, but. God said, I will switch your destiny. I will switch your personality. I will switch your image from Jacob to Israel. So when Esau saw Jacob, what he saw was Israel. He didn't see Jacob. And he could not touch Israel because Israel hadn't offended him. By the end of this fast, God will change your identity. I said, God will change your identity. Somebody say yes. Yes. I want you to look at me. I want you to look at me. Do you realize that Paul and Silas only made it the next day because they engaged God in prayer at midnight? Hear me. Nothing happens until somebody prays. Stop talking. You talk too much. Stop talking. Stop nagging. And if you're a real woman of God and you're a real man, go into prayer. That's all. 
I was dealing with a, a friend of mine, a man of God, at a time when I was going through some crisis, and he was just messing up with me. And I said, I said, you know, brother, I said, we've known ourselves for many years. I said, I'm taking this matter to God in prayer, so you better take it to God in prayer, too. He said, what do you mean? I said, at the end of the day, we will see who is wrong and who is right. And I said, I'm not engaging you physically. I'm going to engage you on my knees before God. And I took him before God in prayer. One month after, he came to me and said, please, let's forget this whole thing. Let's be friends. And I said, why do you want us to be friends? He said, I can't sleep in the night. I, I always see you standing by my bedside. And I said, it's not me. <laughs> Hello? You ready? You ready for some open doors? You ready to engage God? And to engage the enemy? Okay, let me give you one more key. Jesus said, And to you I give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And what things soever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And what things soever you lose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So look at me. There are bindables and there are losables. It's not everything you bind. It's not everything you lose. But watch me. Before you can bind something, and before you can lose something, you must know the mind of God by revelation. Because the reason why, hear me, to, to none of the apostles did Jesus said, I'll give you the keys. Only Peter. The keys were given to Peter alone. You know why the keys was given to Peter alone? Because he was the only one who had the ability to tap into the intelligent networks of heaven and download the divine intelligence and jesus said because you accessed my father in heaven and you know the decisions of heaven about matters of the earth i'm giving you the keys so you can access the throne room of god to receive and to download information and pray them through on the earth and he said because you have access to heaven by by the revelation, I'm giving you keys so you can know what heaven has bound concerning matters of the earth. And you can bind by enforcing it. And I'm going to give you access so you can know what heaven has loose about the matters of the earth and you can enforce it. So watch this. Some of you are waiting for God to bind. He's not going to bind. You got to know what to bind and you got to know what to lose. And you can't know what to bind and you can't know what to lose unless you are moving in revelation. Somebody say revelation. revelation. Somebody say pre nostrus. Pre nostrus. Now lift up your hands, put your Bible down. In the name of he who died and lay in the grave and arose by your front on the third day, we declare, get yourself and be broken in pieces. Assemble yourself from the east, north, south, and west and be broken in pieces. Take your counsels in the regions of the sea and it shall